Now we all know that infection associated HLH is one of the common causes of respiratory HLH. There may be underlying genetic HLH, so even if you have a genetic HLH, you must rule out infection. And presence of an infection still does not differentiate between your familial versus your acquired HLH, which has been already spoken about. From an ID point of view, when we see, uh, when would we suspect HLH? I mean, when would we really refer the patient to a hematologist? There are two conditions. When I see a PO, and in which I have not made a diagnosis, and I'm serially following up this patient and I start getting pancytopenia, following ESR. And that's the time when you really work up for HLH. The second instance in which we really suspected HLH is when you have a diagnosed condition. Say for example, you've already diagnosed dengue or you've already diagnosed tuberculosis. The fever is just not coming down. And again, when you start seeing this pancytopenia coming up, you do the peritin, you do the triglycerides, you do the ESR. And yet, when you find these conditions positive, and then you refer to the hematologist to a bone marrow. So these are the two conditions in which we really find infection-associated HLH. Common infections, everything. In our country, I think it would be more of dengue, tuberculosis. We've seen HIV-causing HLH, EBV, CM, Rito, books. If you go through the literature, every possible infection has been uh, one of the causative factors. I think any infection that goes uncontrolled is ultimately going to precipitate an HLH. The thing that we need to know here is how do we treat this? Do we treat the infection? Do we treat the HLH? We have to treat the infection. I have seen two patients with EBV, infectious mononucleosis. They didn't go on to develop HLH, but they did develop pancytopenia. And when we treat it, though it's known that in infectious mononucleosis you don't require anti herpes treatment, uh, when we started these patients on treatment, they responded. One patient was there in Nanavati last month. One was a zero positive child who got glands, pancytopenia, and just went on and we did an DV PCR which was positive in a child who had an HIV viral which was undetected. So in those patients when we treated, they had an excellent response. EBV associated HLH is usually reactivation of EBV. It's hardly that you'll see it with infectious mononucleosis. So with primary infection, th this is exactly what I told you. The two cases that we had with infectious mononucleosis, though they develop pancytopenia, they didn't go on to develop HLH. But it's the reactivation that causes, and it's because of your um, CD8 cells that's the problem. So. Infection associated HLH, I'm going to restrict it only to this much because we've already had this in the previous talks by Dr. Mukesh Desai, Dr. Rashmi Dal, he has already spoken on EBV related HLH. But two conditions, we've seen typhoid causing HLH and when we actually just continue with the antibiotics, the HLH response. So there's always this query, when do you really start the protocol for HLH? Because the fever comes down, the pancytopenia improves, we've had a few patients like that. So that's the dilemma that occurs. Though you fulfill the criteria of 2004 criteria, do you really treat them or do you wait for that infection to come under control with your antivirals or antibiotics? The second part of the talk, uh, we have this one and a half year old boy, fever for 15 days, a generalized tonic-clonic convulsion following which he had lost all his milestones. When he came to our hospital, we had hepatosplenomegaly with jaundice with constant upward gaze and no meningeal sign. So that's where the hepatologist comes into the picture and the first reference comes to either Shilpa or to me, how do you, what do we go about doing this? Now when we saw this child, pancytopenia is there, bilirubin is high, liver enzymes are on the higher side, there's hypoalbuminemia, CSF which was done outside was normal and the CT brain shows multiple areas of myelination. So, we really see this liver involvement in HLH which comes across. Bone marrow showed, because of the pancytopenia, we had to do a bone marrow which showed hemophagocytosis. Viral markers in form of dengue, leptospira, HVSAG, HIV negative. Again, affordability becomes an issue. So, I think we miss out on a lot of CMV, EBV because of the cost issues. So, these are the problems. This child was started on treatment, but then he lost, we lost this child because of intracranial bleeds. So you would get a child. This child presented actually like a hepatic NK. He came with uh, CNS involvement, no meningeal signs, CSF normal, and an icterus. So you could have an HLH which is presenting to you just as uh, hepatic NK. So 
The point here is, if I see a child, when as a hepatologist would I consider a pancytomania? For me, in a liver case, could also mean hypersplenism. It could also mean severe sepsis. So when would I really think of HLH here? If I have hepatitis, fulminant hepatitis, a pancytopenia, not a high ESR, that's the time I'm really thinking of HLH and I get the hematologist involved. Liver disease and HLH, uh, enzymes are supposed to be almost 80% abnormal in 80% of patients and hepatomegaly occurs almost in half the uh, number of patients. Jaundice is one of the uh, prognostic factors. So if you have a very high jaundice, then you're going to be in trouble. And we know the immune mechanism that's occurring and the pulmonary hepatic failure is basically occurring because of a hepatic cytokine storm. If you, if you do a biopsy in these patients, you're actually going to see a biopsy like a chronic hepatitis. There's going to be the portal triaditis that is mentioned, the lymphocytes, the immunoblast and the histiocytes. One case I wanted to discuss further was a one month old boy came with jaundice and high colored urine. Now this becomes neonatal cholestasis for us. So when we see jaundice in a one month old child, we think of neonatal cholestasis. He's had progressive abdominal distension for 15 days and blood in stool. So he's a sick child. This is not your biliary atresia kind of a neonatal cholestasis. There's no clay colored stools. On examination, we find this child has jaundice, anasaka, hepatosplenomegaly, altered centrosodium, left sided hemiparesis. So for us, there's a CNS involvement, there's a liver involvement, and he's a sick child. If you see his investigations, he does have pancytopenia. So full setting for an HLH. Bilirubin is 26, enzymes are not that high, prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time, derange. Ferritin is 10,000. So if we take your criteria, yes, he fits into the criteria. Torch titers, negative. Triglycerides, normal. Any liver disease which is permanent hepatic failure is going to have a low fibrinogen. So this does not help me to make a diagnosis of HLH. So here we did an MRI because this child had high ferritin, sick looking child, pancytopenia but not fitting completely into HLH protocol. And we saw iron deposits in the liver, spleen, pancreas. So we labeled this child as neonatal hemochromatosis. We treated him for neonatal hemochromatosis. Next day the child died. We did a buccal biopsy in this child and the buccal biopsy showed iron deposition. So one of the differential diagnoses of uh, neonatal HLH is actually neonatal hemochromatosis. And there's always a dilemma, is this HLH, is this neonatal hemochromatosis? Because both have got high ferritin. Right now I have a child in NICU at Wadia who's come with a bilirubin of 35, ferritin of 12,000 no pancytopenia, MRI is showing all the deposits. This child we've started on the treatment for neonatal hemochromatosis. His belly has come down to 18 right now. So you could have an overlap and purposely I put this case because this child had pancytopenia, one of your marker of uh, HLH and why this overlap takes place. So when we see neonatal uh, cholestasis in a sick looking child, one of the differential diagnoses is always HLH, apart from hemochromatosis and all your metabolic disorders. We know HLH can be induced by various infections. We need to treat these infections. Some of them do come out with just treatment of the infection and we may not require a treatment protocol of HLH here. We need to screen them for EDV, CMV, herpes simplex, apart from your dengue and all that. The other entity which Dr. Rashmi Dalvi mentioned was VAHS, virus associated uh, hemophagocytosis, which we used to actually see them earlier. I do get references in the liver clinic from the hemat department where this child has been treated for VAHS many, many years back and now this child on follow-up has raised liver enzymes and he's gone into a chronic hepatitis. He did have an EBV positive at that time. So you have this EBV which can also cause uh, persistent liver damage that can over occur over a period of time. And they do come up, out with even autoimmune hepatitis. So two cases we've had like that, VAHS, who were actually later on developed autoimmune hepatitis and we had to just treat them for autoimmune hepatitis. So these children will need a long follow-up. They can get this liver involvement even later. In neonatal period, always keep neonatal hemochromatosis in mind as a differential diagnosis. And for the students, 
from a pure point of view, when would you suspect HLH? When should you get the hematologist involved? When you have pancytopenia? Our differentials for pancytopenia are very clear. Aplastic anemia, malignancy. We never think of HLH except for Vardia. We call it the Vardia diagnosis. So anybody who's got pancytopenia and Vardia rule out HLH. So if there's pancytopenia with jaundice and a low ESR that is there, then we always think of HLH. Thank you very much.